I'm delighted to welcome Professor Mary O'Kane to give our keynote. I'm not going to introduce her. You all know Mary. Extraordinaire, ex-chief scientist and engineer. And she made the uh, title include that. And that's really important for visibility. So she needs no introduction. But most relevantly, she's leading the university's accord review at the moment, of which I'm sure you're all familiar. And hopefully, she'll give us some insights. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, George, for organising this, and an apology for uh, wrecking the original date. Well, I didn't. The Minister Jason Clare did by saying he'd launched the interim report from the Accord Review on the 19th of July, which was the date we were supposed to be having this. Um, I should mention right at the start that I actually didn't put the engineer bit in the state title. It's many people here did it, and they're nodding, yes, so I can sort of spot the, the ones who did it. But what the state did, of course, was called it scientific engineer, and I used to gag every time I had to mention it. So what I did was got rid of the scientific, so that was the <laughs> it's a sort of doubtful claim to fame. But anyway, I think it was a good thing. Um, I am really grateful for this because I've been wishing there were more seminar days like this across all the disciplines be, as we wrestle in the sort of very broad frame of the Accord Review. And because there are very difficult topics to discuss and what you said in that, uh, those words, Catherine, is absolutely right. The skills challenge across the board is enormous and the skills challenge becomes particularly sharp in the engineering and related disciplines, including ICT. Um, so what I'm, I'm not going to give a, a riveting speech today. What I am going to do, though, is try to make the main points that are worrying us in the accord. Um, and this is a very important week. It's good that we were able to hold the, this event this week because the submissions, the final round of submissions for the accord are due on Friday, and there are no extensions. As a matter of fact, I just sent Attila Brungs a, a text message in response to an inquiry. Could he have an extension? No. Um, we're saying it to everyone. I just mentioned poor Attila because, you know, if we're saying it to Attila, we're, we're definitely saying it to everybody. Um, so thank you for the submissions to date in the rounds that have been through. But please, it, it, you, maximum three pages. You can put as many attachments as you like. But anything you've got to say, please send it in. It'll be valued, it'll be read, definitely read, definitely valued and definitely included. Um, so... What's the, what's the moving on process? Do we have a clicker? Sorry. Oh, no, no, I'm waving. To, oh. This is great for an engineering phenomenon. Thank you. Oh, the green one. The one at the front. Thank you. <laughs> That's really good. Um, what I'm going to do is, is structure what I'm going to say around the, uh, the interim report, the one famously with the echidna, because, as you know, the story, the minister asked us for bold ideas, spiky ideas, gave him an echidna. Um, it has caused a problem. What are we going to put on the front of the, the final report? Um, Professor Larissa Brent from UTS, a member of the panel, wants us to use butterflies for complex reasons about aspiration. Um, but anyway, th so that's just another little challenge. If you can, if anyone with good graphical sense can think what ought to go on for the final report, that'll be good. Something to demonstrate the skills shortage and what we're doing to do it would be great, but what is the animal? Um, so the, and I, I want to go through the interim report partly because reading what the minister calls a bench press report, lift it up and it's very heavy, so not a lot. Will, not everyone will have had a chance to go through it, and use that to make some comments, particularly about engineering. So the report has five immediate recommendations. It includes a vision for Australia, which is not a vision of this is exactly what it would look like, but this is the characteristics it would have. And then, despite a lot of commentary in the press that there are 75 recommendations or 150 recommendations, whichever way you can count in different ways, actually there are 12 packages of ideas and it's those we want the responses on taken holistically. And I'll talk about, about those. 
Um, as I said, we released the interim report. We gave it in on time on the 30th of June and the Minister released it and made an announcement about accepting the five recommendations on the 19th of July. So the, the, the first set of recommendations are a little bit odd in some ways, but they were things that could be done immediately, partly uh, to get going on a few very important things, partly to shore up the universities over the period which the university will be used and partly to implement some government priorities. The first one, of course, and I want to come back to this, was the creation of more regional university centres. Now, these have proved they were somewhat under the radar. I didn't know a lot about them before I started doing the work on the Accord. But they're centres that have been created around the country, um, and there now will be more of them, 14 or so more, uh, where if you like, the local council has bid to have one of these to host one and students who are doing online courses from universities around the country or doing TAFE courses online come together to study in the little town or wherever they are and even though they mightn't be studying the same thing, they're in a, they, there's a little bit of support for ICT, there's support for learning and there's a, as a little learning community they work and they've proved incredibly successful in getting people from remote towns, and they're not that remote, you know, we're talking St George or Deer and Bandy for those who know southwest Queensland, um, the, the people, kids who would never have gone on to university or people who are thinking of upgrading their career and, you know, might be in their sort of 20s or women with kids who, you know, spend a few hours studying. and. So keep that in mind when discussions today. How might we take advantage of these? The other thing the Minister um, is creating at our suggestion is a outer metropolitan version of these. Even though you might think there are, you know, Western Sydney University does a great job of covering Western Sydney in terms of um, a large number of campuses, but there are what you might think of as black holes where it's very hard to get to campuses. So you get places like Fairfield. Um, and so we're suggesting that an outer set of outer metropolitan university centres that are like these regional ones are created. So think about that as we think about equity and because engineering with its um, laboratory work, um, with its need for intense tutorials and things, will can we use these? But I think we've got to find ways. The second recommendation was getting rid of the 50% pass, uh, well, fail rule really, that you got knocked out if you um, didn't pass 50% of your subjects. And this is a very, this particularly hits people from low socioeconomic groups. So it's really important to think about this and it's, I think, been a popular thing to move. But in implementing it, the Department of Education has taken up our idea of reporting on progress and has made that fairly tough. So universities that don't show that they're doing something about students who are likely to fail are really going to be in for a tough time. The third one was extending um, a place for all First Nations students at, as to um, metropolitan First Nations students, so that's important. How do we not only have that extend a place for them, but make sure several of them go into engineering, and I'll come back and talk a bit more about that. The fourth one goes to keeping universities going over the period the Accord will be implemented. So it's uh, technically called the Higher Education Continuity Guarantee. Now why that's important, it's important our universities don't fall over in a funding sense, but it's also important because demand for universities is very soft at the moment because of the high employment. And all sorts of str strange things that I won't go into unless somebody wants to ask me a question happen when you've got low demand. But with the money that's freed up by this guarantee, by guaranteeing that universities will have the level of funding that they've got at this year carried on for another two, with the sort of spare money because of the soft demand, this money has to go into equity students. Is this an opportunity for engineering to work out how to sort of try and deal with the equity cases more? And then the last recommendation that's been approved, and there's been a bit of noise for those of you who are on university councils, is the improvement of university governance to do a couple of things. 
One is to make sure the membership includes more people who know about the business of universities. We've been very good with, through state government reviews of through all the states of including people with expertise in business, expertise in law, accounting and so on. But what we'd forgotten was to keep expertise on universities themselves and that business, which is quite a complex business. And so the membership of universities in through National Cabinet the membership of university councils will be um, adjusted to make sure that expertise is added. But we also put a focus on universities being good employers because of the fair work issue at the moment and the underpayment of casual staff. Now this is again a complex issue, how much are universities to blame? It's an issue because of complex EBAs, not just in higher education but in lots of areas like the care economy. But it doesn't mean it's a good thing and it does need to be solved. And then, of course, talking about student and staff safety, which has turned into surprising things come up in big reviews, and one of them has been the safety matter. The, on the, now onto the sort of organisation of the things. The, recommend, the terms of reference of the review basically had, there are seven terms of reference. Three of them go to major outputs skills, equity and new knowledge. Four of them, which I won't go through in detail, go to making a fit for purpose sector. So they cover things like quality funding, international students, links between vet and higher education. Um, all the things that you need to do to make the sector good. And I should actually say what I, I do say in most talks on the review, Australia has a very, very good higher education sector. We rank in world terms, if you look up any of the various world rankings on full sectors, we tend to come third, fourth, fifth, somewhere there, coming in behind the US and the UK, vying with places like Canada. Um, so a good system. Uh, if you look at the quilt data, the students are reasonably satisfied with their courses, probably could do better and we probably could have better ways of measuring it. but. Okay. In research, the universities are incredibly good in Australia. Australia is badly under its OECD comparators in terms of R&D as a, um, expenditure as a percentage of GDP. But the university expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP is higher than the average. And our university researchers really do the, they do all the research training all the formal research training, adjunct supervisors can be there, but they're not, they, no other organisation but universities can give higher degrees, high, um, PhDs. And our universities do the bulk of our basic research, they do a lot of our strategic basic, they do quite a lot of the applied, they do the bulk of the publications, and our publications are remarkably um, joint with laboratories overseas. Australia is still producing whatever it is, about 4% of the world's public scientific publications and we've only got about 0.31% of the world's population. So we're still over the odds in research and that's one of the challenges of the review, how you fund it. Anyway, back to these packages of ideas. As Catherine emphasised, the desperate need in the skills area is, is very, very strong. So that's... That's, one, that's the first term of reference of the review, meeting Australia's skill needs. And that goes to issues like working with VET, thinking more of a tertiary education system than just a higher education system and a VET system, how we might have a, a common system. But the question that bedevils this thing right, and, and I suppose, sorry, one of the other good things is the government has created Jobs and Skills Australia to try and estimate exactly where we need graduates and in, or and vet trained people and in what areas. But the more Jobs and Skills Australia does its work and the more we do studies like ATSI does, the more we realise what a challenge we have here in the skills area. And the numbers are, are daunting and we have to get that, those skills numbers up very quickly. And I talked to you about the soft demand at universities. The whole thing comes together to be something of a wicked problem. If we look at the second term of reference, we get a hint towards the solution to the first term of reference, and that's the equity term of reference. How do we make sure that Australians are missing out on the opportunity to go to university don't miss out? How do they get to go? 
And to meet the estimated numbers in the skills area as we move over the next decades, and the, and the accord is looking out over many, many decades, um, we, one of the big areas where we can find potential uh, students who hopefully then become graduates and, and work in the various skills needs areas are the equity areas, those that are missing out. And so we have to have a gigantic injection of people who are not going to university at the moment, wanting to go, getting to university and getting through successfully. The other big area is that is new knowledge slash research. As I said, the universities are very, very good in research. And I would say our engineering research is some of the most, you know, exceptionally good research in, in the nation. But one of the big problems is we do have this sort of powerhouse of Australian universities research, but how used is it? How much is it being put into use? And I mean partly through commercialisation, and we spend a lot of time in our academy talking about commercialisation, but also about the solving of problems. How do we make sure government is using our research capacity to solve wicked problems that it faces, like climate extremes, is one that I obviously have a bit of familiarity with from a bit of flood and fire experience. And um, I mean, in those two inquiries here in New South Wales into the, the floods and before that the fires, it was wonderful to be able to draw on the ARC Centre of Excellence in Climate Extremes, for example, headquartered at that point at the University of New South Wales, uh, for both inquiries or to the work done at ADFA uh, by Jason Sharples on bushfires, you know, to have the world's leading expert in extreme fire uh, in Australia has been tremendously helpful. But are we doing enough of that, that pull through? So that's, they're the sort of big questions of the review and where the I would very much appreciate comment from the engineering domain and related technologies on, on that in those areas. The remaining um, packages of ideas go to First Nations and um, as Catherine said, we've doubled the numbers in engineering from First Nations but of low base. So our current numbers of First Nations students in engineering is, is about uh, 2%. <laughs> so it came off a very, no, uh, yeah, I think it is two at the moment and um, I'll come to that anyway in, in a later slide. The setting of targets. Some of you who read what Andrew Norton writes, Andrew's doubting whether we can meet the sort of targets that we've been talking about in the review. They are very, very high, and he's right to doubt it. We, to meet the sort of targets that we're talking about in the skills area and the equity area is very scary, so we'll have to be very good about it. Learning and teaching is a really important one, and one that was, has, in my view, been underdone in the submissions. We heard remarkably little in the first few rounds of submissions about learning and teaching. And one of the things, I mean, I was particularly pleased to see the work done at UNSW in engineering in the maker spaces, and the, the sort of really exciting hands-on experience, and the work done in bringing um, virtual sort of tutorials making them feel real. There's a lot, we, we really, because of the pandemic, are in the middle of a learning and teaching revolution where people increasingly see that they will do a lot of work online and a lot of people working online is really important if they have care responsibilities or work responsibilities. But how do we make them feel that they're in a, in a tutorial, able to talk safely? I really mean what I said, what I was quoted as saying in the AFR last week, that bring back the tutorial. We really need, in these very large universities we have in Australia, and the size of university is something else I'd appreciate comments on, we really need that students feel they're having a good experience and really are able to learn and acquire skills when they're at university, learn to be real engineers. Um, international education is an interesting issue. It's important in a, from a point of view of things like um, earning money and it's a tremendous uh, export industry and whatever it is about second or third, well the first of the service industries in Australia in export terms. But are we over reliant on the money um, and how do we use it more for soft diplomacy purposes? The, then there's the link of higher education and our communities, particularly our regional communities. I mentioned the link to BET. Funding is a really big issue, as you can imagine, not just the 
the quantum of funding, but actually how to break up how much should be funded through the HEX system, how much through the Commonwealth contribution, what levels should there be, um, are we able to get efficiencies in the, the whole system in the way we teach, how do we fund that great research activity, really big, really incredibly big problems. Quality control, regulation are important, where should TEXA be, is TEXA working, there does seem to be a general agreement that having a regulator has been really important for higher education and the regulator for VET has been in court. And then the last issue we, we particularly talk about is the accord itself. The work of the review is only the precursor to the real work. Then when uh, the review finishes, the accord will start. And that is a conver an ongoing conversation down the decades between government, universities, and uh, industry and the unions about what we want of higher education and how it delivers on national needs. So going through, before I get shown those coloured slides about five minutes left and so on, um, let me quickly talk through the, some of the major areas. So on the skills topic, I've talked a bit about the numbers of skills, but estimating exactly how many people you need in what disciplines, including in new disciplines, is really important. Student mobility is important. Do, does everyone do their full course in the place they start? It's something the, um, the student unions have been emphasising to us, that students want to be able to transfer easily, and might it be that certain universities would specialise in certain skills? Jobs and Skills Australia are saying to us that new types of skills are needed. Um, we need to have leading edge skills. How are we going to do it? A really important thing is um, sector responsiveness. Universities are good at, good at what they do, but when new disciplines are needed or some disciplines are not needed, are they very good at gearing up quickly and winding down quickly? So the winding down, some examples that have caused a lot of pain is, for example, in geology. You know, we go boom bust like the mining industry. We sort of build up the geology departments and then when there's a sort of a lack of demand from the mining industry, we have to close them. So we go through all, and we, it's a very painful closure. And no sooner is that round of closures finished than the mining industry booms up again. So how do we get better at adjusting the numbers and getting the numbers through very quickly? One of the really, and, and I, let me jump here to talking about cooperative skills centres, an idea from Mark, um, supported by another member of our, our academy, uh, Alex Selinsky. Um, the idea of cooperative skills centres is something that the panel for the Accord Review has been very taken with, the idea that you use the cooperative research centres as a model but do it for skills and can be ways to get into new skills areas very, very quickly and probably wind down reasonably quickly. So there's something that we're definitely, I hope there'll be discussion of them today. Um, another thing we're spending a lot of time on, the engineering and professional will be pleased to know, is placement and work integrated learning. And not only um, what's needed in placement, but how it should be supervised from industry and how do um, students get the opportunity to get the very best placement. Also, might the students be paid while they're doing placement? Megan Lilly um, from the AIG, put, she's, she's going to talk in the next session, very kindly put on an AIG webinar uh, a week or so ago where we were able to raise the idea, might industry, might industry pay? And that would be very good if we could get really top quality placement and an opportunity for students to get some money out of it because so many students work these days that if they have to go off and do placement, often they have to give up their job. And this is there's this new term that's used a lot in the area is placement poverty. And so how do we make sure that doesn't happen in our area and that in, the, in producing good graduates, we make sure the placement is fantastic? So that's a, an important thing where I'd very much like comments. One of the problems, not so much in our fields, but very much in the care economy and in teaching, is that the limitation on the number of placement places has meant there's a limitation on the number of intake. But a lot of the things, when I look at it, the placement is often very long 
and maybe some of it could be automated and other ways of doing it. So alternative ways of managing placement are something we're very interested in, in doing. In the skills area, as well as looking to the equity numbers to get the numbers, we obviously need people to engage with lifelong learning. So how do we do that in engineering? How might we use micro-credentials, for example, in a portable and stackable way to actually get people to reskill in various areas, both at postgraduate, coursework postgraduate areas, but also how might we do it at undergraduate or around enabling courses? How might we use more flexible things to get people to come through? Another really important area we talk about is that how can people leave courses and still get some sort of qualification? So we talk about the skills passport, but you need more than the passport. Can they come out with an associate degree or can they come out with a diploma? And they might go back at some point, but it's important they've got something. And so one of the things we recommend, of course, is the review of the AQF, that that actually be finally implemented, which is sitting on the shelves. So there's a whole series of things there that I'm sure there'll be good things out of today discussed. The next big area of um, sort of delivery is, of course, the equity area. And in this area, we recommend, or we propose, or whatever word we're using at the interim report where we were a bit soft on the verbs, um, we think that, that a, a set of things is needed and tightly coupled to get where we need. One is, for equity groups, they don't often know, they often are not encouraged to go to universities by their families or their backgrounds. You only have to hear Jason Clare's talks on this to hear a, a case of a kid who, you know, was discouraged. Um, so the first thing is building aspiration, building an idea, and there are three education reviews on at the moment. There's the early childhood one, there's the schools one, and there's the higher education one. And meeting with the other chairs, one thing we, we believe in together very strongly is that this aspiration needs to build from the very youngest stages. And, you know, we were talking in the, you know, standing around before this, do kids even know what being an engineer is? How do you make sure they do? How do you tell them when they're tiny tots at kindy? How do you make sure there's good careers advice? How do you make sure the families know what's needed? So building aspiration is important. The next part of this sort of ladder of things is enabling courses. And how do we make them probably free? Make sure there are good enabling courses. Should they be in the vet sector? Should they be in higher ed? Should they be in colleges within universities? How do we get great enabling things that get people to a level they might need? Because we're not suggesting to lower the entry level for university, rather keep it high, but make sure more people can, can get there. When people get into their degree courses, how do you give the scaffolding learning support? How do you scaffold the support around those students so they don't fall out? First year is a dangerous time for students, a lot a trit at that point. How do we make sure they get on? Because we're not about just getting them into courses, we're about getting them through. We're about getting them through in minimum time with minimum hex debt. And then about removing roadblocks. One of the saddest things about doing this Accord Review for me has seen how hard it is for students to manage income support and what a big problem it is, how students who had, can't live at home, how do they afford rent, even those living at home, how do they contribute to the family um, sort of living arrangements. And it's, it's a really big issue. So what should we do to take away the sort of roadblocks that affect them? Um, and this area is, is one of the really, really big challenges of the review is, is getting, because we don't know enough about it. Within engineering, let's talk about a couple of things here. One is, is the maths background. We want to get the numbers up in terms of uh, engineers, but many students are going to schools where the maths is, would not prepare them for an engineering degree. Are there ways, and I know I've been banging on about this for 30 odd years since I was a Dean of Engineering myself, are there ways to take students into engineering, bright students, get them through in the four years, but doing the maths within the course, not having to do it um, before they get in? Because that raises the hex debt and raises the time till they get out as graduates. So are there ways that we can think about that creatively? And over time in Australia, there have been some fantastic examples, but they've tended to lapse. How do we bring that back? Because 
we are going to absolutely have to produce the engineering numbers that are required or, or our economy will lapse and we'll have the uh, consequent societal problems. So that's really important. And if we do nothing else today, if we could talk about that, that would be absolutely fantastic. Another thing, going back to the placement issue that we're suggesting is the idea of a jobs broker, and Maury um, reminded me that you know there's been versions of, of this around in the past. The idea is that there be a jobs broker, came out of a, a BCA seminar we did, that uh, helps students find jobs when they're, part-time jobs when they're stu studying so that they can um, have jobs that are in engineering if you're an engineering student, and also help them find the very best of placement. So I want to actually write up the jobs broker idea this week, so any ideas of how it might work would be really appreciated. Just a, a couple of things about the demographics. We've already, um, Catherine's talked about the number of women in engineering. It is still a challenge. We are seeing great women engineers in various areas. I see a lot in the energy sector, and that's fantastic. But that's another pool. They mightn't be um, low SES, but they are a very important thing. So we've still got work to do there. We've already talked about the, in, sorry, it's 1% in, in the Indigenous, where the sector average is two. So how do we double the number of Indigenous engineers? Um, the low SES we're pretty good at, but we're going to have, the whole system's going to rise, so how are we going to take that good? And then in regional and remote, we're not bad, but we'll need to get better. And within the regional and remote area, I particularly want to draw your attention to the suggestion of a national regional university that's proposed and whether there should be a joining of the regional universities that are, have a lot of trouble existing and how do we make sure that engineering is very much part of the story in the bush. I'm being told I'm close to time, but I've mentioned the research issue and the, the two main themes of the research side of the review have been taking that, thinking about that very strong performance, how do we protect it? Because there isn't a lot of, there, the funding of research is typically done by general university funds, which largely come from international students. How do we make sure there is secure funding for research, for the very best of research um, to go on? So that is still a very big challenge. And the other thing is, how do we make sure it's valued? You'll be pleased to know that when I'm out there talking about the importance of university research, or they're almost always engineering and related examples that I give, because they're the ones I think about, things like Martin Green and the solar cells, Graham Jameson and the, the Jameson cell. I never thought of the two of them being cells, but anyway. Um, but Hughes' work, you know, Hughes' work on the automatic mine and the um, automated ports and so on. There are many, many examples. But how do we make sure it is valued and used and becomes not something that people laugh about academic research, but they say academic research with respect? So we're at the point now of asking what should turn into final recommendations? What's urgent? Because as well as making recommendations, we have to make them with a timing f uh, frame around them. And as I said, we're looking at decades. But what should happen immediately? What should happen over time? Um, what have we overlooked? What, what should, be, should be modified? And as I said, right at the start, if you haven't done it already, get busy because the submissions close with no extensions on the 1st of September. Thank you. It was, it's really great to have this opportunity to talk. Yes. Yeah, B, the BCA raised that, and because of the sensitivity around tax reform, not a lot got into the interim report. It would be wonderful to get some submissions even if they were just dot point submissions saying that, that would be fantastic. Thank you. 
Yeah. yeah. Richard, hi. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Fantastic presentation. Um, my question is, you've mentioned regional centres as the way yeah. to go to address a whole lot of the issues, but you also touched on our um, teaching and learning skills. Yeah. So are we ready to go for something along the lines that you're sort of proposing with the regional delivery? Uh, that it's a really, really good question. And, and I don't think we're adequately ready, but it is amazing. It, it's one of those... The regional university centres, these little, basically a shed with, you know, a few students in it and somebody helping with the ICT and learning out here, how successful they are. And it seems that a lot of the success comes out of that old phenomenon of peer, you know, peer learning, when people learn together. So while I think we're not doing learning and teaching as well as we should, strangely enough, sometimes maybe we're undervaluing aspects of the whole issue. We do put a lot of emphasis on training for academics in teaching, as well as their other activities, research and management activities, but I think it is something that's important, particularly for the bush. And if we go for the National Regional University, joining up the existing universities in the, in the regions, or some of them, engineering is probably going to be one of those disciplines that's partly taught here and there and somewhere else. Are we ready to offer that sort of course? And I don't think we're... I think it is a challenge. Yeah. Maury's got a question. He, he got loaded up with one. Yeah. Having a look at... Having a look at what Canada does with its um, federally funded uh, co-op, government-funded co-op. We need to put in more. Put it in the submission. <laughs> 